myself. My name is Kelly Vlahos, and I am the editorial director of Responsible Statecraft, the online foreign policy magazine of the Quincy Institute. I'm very proud to open our conference today, what a foreign policy for the middle class looks like, realism and restraint amid global conflict. If you are not familiar with the Quincy Institute, we are a research and advocacy organization dedicated to reframing the way that Washington thinks about and directs its foreign policy. Our co-sponsors, the American Conservative, represent the best in independent thinking about the dangers of international interventionist policies that impinge on the freedom and prosperity of Americans at home. We are so happy to make common cause with them today for this event, bringing together left and right and all voices in between, a true representation of Main Street interests and matters of war and peace. In March 2021, newly minted St Secretary of State Antony Blinken announced the Biden administration had set out to pursue a new foreign policy for the middle class. He said, We've set the foreign policy priorities for the Biden administration by asking a few simple questions. What will our foreign policy mean for American workers and families? What do we need to do around the world to make us stronger at home? And what do we need to do at home to make us stronger in the world? If we do our jobs right, you'll be able to check our work, to see the links between what we're doing in the world and the goals and va values that I've laid out. So our goal here today is, in essence, to check their work, looking back at the last three years and seeing if indeed it has fulfilled those priorities. Our speakers today will offer varying degrees of responses to that question, no doubt. But in the spirit of Quincy and TAC, they will also challenge, I know, the decades of conventional thinking that continue to animate endless U.S. military interventions abroad including direct and proxy wars, often ill-defined and without proper congressional oversight or input from the general public. Many here will argue that these overseas policies, which also include security agreements and tangling alliances throughout the world and keep Washington as security guarantors, end up benefiting a small elite here in Washington, on Wall Street, and in Silicon Valley while the American people coast to coast and in the heartland between feel and struggle to understand how it makes their lives better at home. These Americans may be shut out of the discourse, but their sons and daughters are fighting these wars and taxpayers fund the trillions of dollars and weapons and resources expended in their names in such far flung places as Somalia, Ukraine, Syria, the Asia Pacific, Europe and Iraq today. To say that the American people are fed up is an understatement. They vocalize their frustrations at the polls and in voting, and they're not enlisting, they're not enlisting to serve our, their country. In fact, recruitment is down, the worst in recent memory. Military families are often the most passionate in their criticisms as US forces including the National State Guards, National Guards have been in constant deployment cycles since 2001. On Capitol Hill, lawmakers on both sides of the aisle raise alarms about war with China while plowing billions of dollars into a war in Ukraine and into Israel's war in Gaza. Our stockpiles are shrinking, but the defense industry salivates. Endless war means big business. But our conversations today need not to be all backward looking, pointing fingers um, or engaging in the Washington blame game. We want to peer forward to and provide new guideposts for a better way of doing things. In many ways, those guideposts have been with us all along. We just needed the pol political courage and the support to actually follow through with them. So without further ado, I'm gonna pass this over to my colleague, George Beebe, who is a director of grand strategy at the Quincy Institute for our first panel. Thank you, George. Thank you very much, Kelly. Um, I wanna start out by saying that uh, I've never been to a foreign policy conference like this one. I've been to a lot of foreign policy conferences, but frequently they bring together experts that know a lot about what's going on in other parts of the world. 
They can talk to you about how much influence Iran might have over Hezbollah, which factions within the Kremlin are currently in Putin's favor. But when you ask them, uh, why do Americans in Ohio care about that? What's at stake for them? Oftentimes, those foreign policy experts are puzzled. They know a lot more about what's going on in their areas of expertise overseas than they do about the United States. So what we're trying to do today is to bring those two worlds together, to talk about that intersection between what's going on in the world and what matters most to heartland Americans. And I can think of no better panel to talk about that than the people we have here today. To my far right uh, is Congressman uh, Warren Davidson, a Republican representing the 8th District of Ohio, has a very interesting background, a graduate of the US Military Academy, served in American Special Forces, also ran his family's manufacturing business. So he's got, I think, in his personal background, exactly this intersection that Senator Vance alluded to earlier today about American manufacturing and foreign policy and, and what matters to Heartland Americans in all of this. Um, next to uh, Congressman uh, Davidson is Helen Andrews. She is senior editor at the American Conservative. She is the author of the book Boomers, the men and women who promised freedom and delivered disaster which I think is a great subtitle for what has happened in American foreign policy over the last several decades. And to my immediate right, Bar uh, Branko Marcetic is a writer at Jacobin Magazine who brings another perspective, I think, that typically comes from the American political left, but I think shares a lot of perspectives on what has gone wrong in American foreign policy and the connection between what our elites are doing in foreign policy and the interests of the American working class. So um, there are some uh, very important debates going on on the House floor, not far from us this morning, that Congressman Davidson needs to get back to to participate in. So I'm going to start out this morning by posing some questions to him. Um, now, uh, before I get into that question, I want to hearken back to something that uh, Jake Sullivan, uh, the Biden administration's national security advisor, said in an early press conference after the Biden administration took office. This is a quote. He said, everything we do in our foreign policy and national security will be measured by a basic metric. Is it going to make life better, safer, and easier for working Americans? So with that as context, I think I want to ask you, Congressman Davidson, we often hear the argument here in Washington that if the United States does not defend a particular foreign state against a particular threat, that some foreign power will take advantage of our inaction, Russia, China, Iran, et cetera. They will grow stronger, they will grow bolder, they will grow more likely ultimately to do something beyond just threatening this foreign state, but will actually threaten American security, the safety of Americans in some way. Essentially, this line of thinking posits that everything's connected to everything. Unless we make a stand in whatever part of the world is currently in the headlines, bad things are going to flow for the American people. We heard this about the global war on terrorism. We're hearing it about Ukraine today. We have to make a stand in Ukraine or the Russians will continue to roll westward and ultimately will not be fighting them in Ukraine, we'll be fighting them here, which I think is a direct quote from some American officials over the years. What do you make of this argument? Is everything connected to everything, or can we and should we, as Senator Vance asserted this morning, make some distinctions, recognize there are trade-offs, set priorities? Are there parts of the world that really matter to us more than other parts? Well, look, I, I sum up that idea as simply, unless we squander our resources all over the world, how could we possibly stay strong? And you're like, 
well, you, you, by not squandering your resources all over the world and by focusing on your own country, uh, you know, you, you know, some have summed it up as an American first foreign policy. And, you know, that that phrase has different connotations, but we should care first and foremost about our own national security. And we shouldn't find fault with others for caring about their own national security. And that is the idea of realism. And what we've got is a, a system that is wants to pretend that there is no such thing. There are only really two ideologies, globalism and isolationism. If you don't support glo globalism, you're clearly an isolationist. And, you know, the... That's just a, a fallacy. And so uh, if you look at um, the metric that uh, Sullivan or Blinken, both were referenced, uh, looking at, well, does this actually benefit our citizens? And it, it's a right question. And the answer is no. The policies haven't benefited our citizens. Uh, and I think that's easy to measure. If you look, you know, since the Cold War, uh, to, to go a bigger view, um, America is less free, less safe, and more burdened by debt. And so uh, if you go since the war on terror, less free, less safe, more burdened by debt. If you go just since the Biden administration, less free, less safe, more burdened by debt. You know, and so how did we prevail in the Cold War? Well, mostly by keeping it cold, um, not by fighting resources. I and mean, maybe the best emblem of that is uh, Dwight Eisenhower. Um, people didn't call him an isolationist, I don't think. You know, he was, uh, you know, pretty successful by being not an isolationist, uh, you know, led on D-Day and led our military very capably um, and was sought by both parties to be the presidential candidate. And so he's like, well, I'm actually a Republican um, and um, did, did a great job. When he first took office, he didn't expand the war in Korea that was already underway. He wrapped it up. And it didn't have a decisive resolution. Uh, it basically drew a line that still exists today along the 38th parallel. And maybe the easiest place left in the world to see where America's involvement really does make a difference. But for America's involvement in South Korea, um, the whole peninsula would be like North Korea. And But for China's involvement, the entire peninsula could be like South Korea. A first world economy, first world health care, uh, you know, for Christian folks, a mission sending country. Uh, faith has flourished in South Korea. And so those are things that reflect our values. They've um, been great for not just uh, South Korea's economy, but ours as well. And you see some level of interdependence that's gone on there. You see the benefit of our ideas that worked uh, in Japan. And it, it, what's been lost along the way is the idea that trade should be core to our foreign policy. Um, and it is one of the most consequential decisions that broke when you say, you know, more, less free, less safe, more burdened by debt. It is the trade policy with China where they said, as a condition of being part of the World Trade Organization, that they would be a market-oriented economy. And no one believes they are because they're not. And, and so there's no pressure applied to them. And it really has hollowed out our middle class. So if you look at the metric, I like the metric that they laid out, judge us by this. Great. Um, I think it's a fine metric. But you would take radically different foreign policies. If you look at this administration, you would think that America is somehow part of Europe, and in particular, Eastern Europe, but right adjacent to Ukraine. Uh, since you've raised Eisenhower, I want to follow up and ask you uh, about two of the big foreign policy issues that he dealt with during his time in office. One, you mentioned Korea. That was a case where there was a territorial dispute, <laughs> Qu quite a serious one between the North and South Koreans. Um, that war ended in an armistice that did not actually settle that territorial dispute. They both still do not recognize the 38th parallel as the formal boundaries of their countries. And yet the war ended. It is no longer raging as it, as it did during Eisenhower's time. Is that a potential model we could apply in Ukraine? Now, before you answer that part, I want to raise a second Eisenhower initiative, the Austrian State Treaty. When World War II ended, uh, Austria was occupied in its western parts by the United States and its allies, and in its eastern portions by the Soviet Red Army. And the question at that time was, would Austria become like Germany 
divided into two states with a hostile uh, line of demarcation between those two territories, both allied to outside powers? Or could we find a way to avoid that kind of dangerous division in Austria? And Eisenhower opted for what became the Austrian State Treaty, which preserved uh, Austria's integrity, its sovereignty, but made Austria a geopolitically neutral state. Are there lessons that we can learn for Ukraine today from those Eisenhower examples? Yeah, I, cer I certainly hope so. Uh, and, and that's part of why I wanted to reference, uh, you know, not just Eisenhower, but Korea, because, you know, that's a dispute that's still there, but there's uh, a state of peace. And are the people on the North Korean side better off? Well, we don't think so. Objectively, you would say no. Um, but certainly the people of South Korea are better off. And if you really want to pursue what's good for the people of, of Ukraine, it would be to not have this war going on, but to preserve their territorial integrity and their sovereignty. And frankly, uh, nothing that this administration's offered proposes a path to resolve the conflict decisively on a battlefield to resolve it diplomatically in a state of peace or to resolve it asymmetrically by creating instability that would re lead to resolution. What they've proposed is a path to continue the war. In fact, that's their phrase. They've um, kind of adopted it because it was so unsuccessful in the war on terror in Afghanistan. In 04, they said, as much as it takes, as long as it takes. And that's how they pivoted from going after uh, you know, the, the terror groups there to basically nation building as a mission. Uh, and they have the same hollow phrase that they're using for Ukraine, um, never defining what victory is, because for them, victory is that it's um, sustained. And if we don't take NATO uh, membership off in the sense like we did in Austria, um, I don't think there will be a path to peace, because for Russia, as long as there's active conflict, then there's probably not a path for immediate membership for Ukraine as a member of NATO. And a long war, frankly, probably is not bad for Russia in a lot of ways, um, but who's it really good for? It's great for China. And I would mention one of the other things that Eisenhower confronted was um, a migration crisis. He had a lot of inflow of um, folks from Mexico, Central America, South America into the United States, California in particular at the time. And there was, a, there was a big push to um, address that, so much so that there was kind of an overreaction in the 60s that has really been disastrous for our immigration policy. So, you know, we, we should be a welcoming country. We should do it legally. We should do it with a secure border. Uh, and I think that work remains very incomplete uh, from the Eisenhower administration to today. Uh, before I let you go off to a uh, floor debate, I want to ask one more question. Um, and I, I would imagine it's a question that you hear from your own constituents when you're, when you're back uh, in your home district. What's at stake for the American people, for the American middle class in Ukraine? Uh, yeah, so that's a good question. You know, people are very sympathetic to Ukraine. They feel like they were wronged. And there are a lot of people that that's enough. There are some people that are, you know, old cold warriors and they were supportive uh, because, well, there's a chance to kill Russians. And that's unfortunately the only logic behind it for some of my colleagues who vote for uh, as much as it takes, as long as it takes. Um, but I can't say that that's a just cause because, uh, <laughs> You know, you're, you're also killing off uh, Ukrainians and uh, without it, with, with a sense of false hope to not resolve it. So for the American people, you know, Ukraine has become more integrated into the Western economy. And you saw some spikes in some of the things that we get from Ukraine, grain uh, as a commodity, uh, fertilizer as a commodity. There's some natural resources that are particularly in the eastern region that are um, – valuable. But the reality is the Western economy didn't have access to these for the entire Cold War. So very little changed. And for most people, um, very little changed when Russia took over Crimea. And if everyone in Ukraine stopped speaking Ukrainian and started speaking Russian again, truly not that much would change. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't care about it. And I think that gets to what uh, Senator Vance was talking about is our values say there's a sense of wrong there. And we do have the ability to 
um, use some form of moral influence, but we should do that in a way that offers a path to resolution of the conflict, not a path to perpetuation of it. And I think that's the big fallacy that we've got there is if we're not laying out a path that that um, uh, uh, contains the spread of this conflict um, that can have a peaceful resolution. And the reality is anyone that's studied anything militarily will say the only way that the Ukrainians win is over a, a generational war like the Taliban, in essence, prevailed against the United States. Uh, we've squandered enough resources here. We're kind of tired of doing this. We're just going to go back on our side of the border. And if that's the kind of war you're going to wage, you can do it more cost effectively. We helped uh, the Afghans do that to the Soviet Union. And and uh, the, the way we're waging it is as if somehow uh, there was going to be a decisive victory on the battlefield that was going to extract all the Russians from Ukraine. And they're counting on that being the perception when they say as much as it takes, as long as it takes. They know that a lot of people back home are going to say, oh, to get the Ukrainian, the Russians out of Ukraine. And we could give truly as much, we give trillions of dollars and Ukraine does not have enough combat power to extract the Russians from Ukraine um, with money, with weapons, with arsenals. It will take additional combat power wielded by others that can deploy it like the United States or NATO member countries. And I don't think that's good for us or the people of Ukraine in the long run. So uh, I hope we choose a different path, but it seems like that's the path we're on. Uh, and you can already see the the mission creep from the Department of Defense saying we need our advisors on the ground. That That's a good way, a proven method of uh, expanding the war. Once you've got tactical support, it's re rapidly viewed as tactical participation. Thank you very much. Very much appreciate your making the time and your busy schedule to join us today. Thanks. Hopefully we're going to go ban central bank digital currency. So uh, I, I have to go do that. <laughs> Thank you. So Helen Andrews, turning to you. Um, one of the arguments in favor of what, what uh, one might call an interventionist approach to the world is the, the argument that uh, democracies don't go to war with each other. You know, this is sort of the Immanuel Kant theory of democratic peace. Um, and it's basically an argument that the United States doesn't just have a moral obligation to support freedom and democracy around the world. It's actually in our security interest to do so because it makes the world more stable and makes Americans safer. And this is an idea that I think has a lot of, of purchasing power here in Washington. Um, and uh, it's, it's one that I think is, is the conventional wisdom, I would have to say, um, between both parties here in the United States. I wonder if you could comment on this. Oh, uh, this one? Yes. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, George. Yeah, people who make that argument, I have a hard time understanding what kind of world they think they're living in. They seem to be positing an imaginary world where I suppose it's true. If every country were part of the informal American empire, there would be very little conflict. That is, you know, a, but that's abuser's logic. That's, you know, we wouldn't have conflict if you just do everything that I say. Um, here, back in the real world, I think the claim that democracies don't go to war with each other does not really bear up empirically. Um, we can see countless examples of democratic elections in places like Latin America or Africa that have led to those countries turning against the United States. And if we look at a particular example, let's look at the war in Ukraine, did that occur because Ukraine is a democracy and Russia isn't. Well, no, it didn't. That test fails on both sides of the equation. Um, there are many aspects of the regime in Russia that are less than democratic, but its foreign policy isn't one of them. The idea that Ukraine is a core interest of Russia's is a, posi a position that's shared across the political spectrum in Russia. So even if Russia were to become more democratic than it is today, its position on the Ukraine issue would be very unlikely to change. And on the other side, the idea that Ukraine uh, pursued this war, got into the current situation that it's in because of democracy also doesn't hold up. 
The reason why President Zelensky won in his presidential race against Poroshenko was because he was in favor of a peaceful settlement to the eastern provinces and their conflict with Russia. And it was only by the United States dumping $5 billion into the civil society sector in Ukraine that we were able to exercise pressure and push the conflict into the hot phase that it's currently in. Um, so this idea that more democracy means more peace uh, doesn't hold up. But the final point, the final point in answer to anyone who tries to make that argument to you is that we live in a world of limits. We live in a world of trade-offs and costs. That's a point that Senator Vance made this morning. He said, Im imagine, let's even grant for the sake of argument that it would be nice to if China were more democratic than it is today. Uh, should we achieve that at the cost of sacrificing the American middle class? Well, I don't know. I, I don't think that's a reasonable trade-off. And in fact, as the senator pointed out, we tried to make that trade and it failed. We got neither our middle class nor their democracy. Uh, or in the case of Ukraine, to go back to that very pressing conflict, um, it would be nice if the regime in Kiev could take back all of the territory that Russia conquered, if they could get the Donbass back, if they could get Crimea back. Uh, sure, in a perfect world, maybe we might support that outcome. But is it worth risking war with a nuclear power to make that happen? Why? Well, I, I think nuclear war is pretty bad for the American middle class. I think it would fail uh, Jake Sullivan's test there. So we have to be reasonable about what we can expect to achieve, uh, even if we were trying to make every country in the world more democratic. Um, I uh, have been remiss in uh, not inviting questions from the audience. Um, at the tables, you'll notice there are note cards and pens. If uh, any audience members would like to pose a question, please write down the question on those note cards, hold it up, and, and one of our uh, conference attendees will gather those up and, and submit them to me, and I can in turn pose them to our panelists. Um, so, Helen, uh, you mentioned nuclear war. Um, over the course of my uh, career, um, I, I began uh, back in the Soviet period as an analyst of Soviet foreign policy. This was a period when avoiding nuclear war between the, the great nuclear superpowers was a central occupation of the United States government. Much of our intelligence was designed to identify warnings that something bad might be coming our way. Much of our diplomacy was focused on arms control, confidence building measures, reaching understandings with the Kremlin uh, on issues that could ensure our mutual security. And I think there was a recognition that the security of Americans was in the nuclear era inextricably linked to the security of the Soviet people. Uh, one side could not be secure if the other side were insecure in this area. And that was the foundation for reaching agreements on containing this arms race, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, I now find myself in a position where that notion that we are co-hostages with the Russians in the nuclear era is, is not just unpopular here in Washington, um, it's regarded as heretical. Um, in fact, the problem that you hear when you listen to a lot of the talk shows on TV or read op-ed columnists is, we should not scare ourselves in Ukraine. We should not allow the Russians to blackmail us into some sort of settlement there um, because you know, the Russians are you know, attempting to you know, instill fear in this and we shouldn't fall for this. Um, let's look at this from the point of view of the, of the American people. Um, how should the interests of Americans intersect with this question of potential escalation? You know, should we be engaging in arms control dialogue with the Russians? What, what's in it for people in Ohio and Indiana, et cetera? The comparison to the Cold War is a fascinating one because the, the biggest shock for me is that it was a staple of American Cold War rhetoric 
that our problem was with communism, not with the Russians. You know, we have no quarrel with the Russian people, only with their regime. Their regime is a particularly odious kind that is ideologically evangelical and world conquering. And that's the reason why our conflict with the communist empire is just categorically different from any other kind of rivalry that our nation has faced in its history. Well, I think the Russians took us at our word when we said that decade after decade. And so in the 90s said, great, uh, the United States will no longer treat us as uh, a, an enemy that needs to be thwarted at every turn. Um, but oddly, we, we seem not to have listened to our own rhetoric during the Cold War, and we have continued to treat Russia with the same, uh, you know, the, just as we did during the Cold War, as someone to be checked at every turn. Um, in, uh, Congressman Davidson said that for many of his colleagues, you know, why is Ukraine a win for the United States? Because it means more dead Russians. That's, I mean, that that is bad as a matter of strategy and also just morally. That that That's not a good place for your head or your soul to be at if you are rejoicing in dead Russians. Um, but as for the don't let Russia blackmail us into, well, you know, that's just, that's reckless is what that is. That's saying we ought to disregard any strengths or the bargaining position that the other power has. I think if we're going to come to a reasonable compromise, it needs to be one that recognizes that the guy on the other side of the table is holding some cards too. We're not the only one. Uh, and failing to do that is a recipe for escalation. Um, so Helen, you've mentioned the moral aspects of all of this. Uh, Senator Vance earlier talked about the moral intuitions of the American people and how that needs to be a factor in shaping uh, American foreign policy. Bronco, I want to turn to you on this. Um, I think most Americans don't like to think of themselves or of the United States as callously indifferent to the sufferings of people overseas. Um, amoral, realist, uh, focus exclusively on their own interests. I think they like to think of themselves in much the same way that Abraham Lincoln characterized this country, you know, the last best hope on earth, dedicated to the, the proposition that we can uh, elevate the condition of all men. So how do we take into account things like human rights, things like responding to the needs of other people overseas? This is a complex question. How do you think about that dimension of our foreign policy as it relates to the, the moral intuitions of, of ordinary Americans? Uh, yeah, let me just say first, Thank you, you guys, for putting us together, uh, number one. Um, but to answer your question, uh, I mean, I think that obviously the United States has a very important role to play in securing human rights and making sure that people aren't, you know, mistreated by their own governments, by foreign governments. Um, the question is, how do you do this? Uh, I think we have to accept two things when it comes to foreign policy. Uh, one is, you know, you were saying limitations. There's limitations in terms of trade-offs, but I think there's also limitations in terms of what uh, the degree to which we are able to actually control events and the degree to which we are able to control or shape the behavior of uh, other states um, through our own actions and in ways that we want to actually do that, um, that, that don't end up blowing up in our faces. Uh, that's number one. I think the other thing we have to accept when it comes to foreign policy, when it comes to anything to do with securing people's human rights and, and basic dignity across the world, um, is that often the options at our disposal are pretty limited. It, it's not a matter of the best outcome and the worst outcome. It's usually a, a choice between catastrophically bad and sort of reasonably acceptably bad um and that that is unfortunate but that is the reality um and so we have to you know i think often temper our expectations around this stuff and understand that we are only going to be able to do so much there's only so much that we can you know control again when it comes to doing this um 
you know, I think when it comes to trying to uh, uh, ensure people's human rights across the world, um, I think one thing we need to think about is uh, uh, if we're going to try and do this, is the course of action that we're going to take, is that going to make things worse? Um, I often think about the example of Libya, which has been conveniently completely forgotten uh, over the last 10 years. Uh, that That was done with very good intentions in mind, I think, at least from from most people. Um, and at the time, it was viewed as a great success. Gaddafi was gotten rid of, a potential massacre of anti-regime uh, forces um, was stopped, and happily ever after. But in reality, um, what ended up happening was, was, was much worse, what followed, um, because you not only had anarchy and then decade or longer of, of civil war in Libya, you had people's basic, you know, human rights, living standards in that country just completely uh, uh, go out the window. But also then you had the snowballing uh, knock-on effects of that war where, you know, weapons spread into Africa and, and that's continued on with the, the crisis that we see now going on in, in Niger and, and, and other parts of West Africa. Uh, so ultimately... You know, I don't think anyone would look at Libya now and say, oh, that was a great success. Um, and I think most people would look at the situation in Libya and say, actually, it was much worse what happened for human rights, people in Libya, people in that region, than uh, that, that we actually got involved, or at least got involved in the way that we did, than if we had done nothing. Um, I think the other thing, you know, speaking about the Ukraine war, since that is going on right now, uh, uh, that started out as a as a well-intentioned intervention to, to prevent, you know, to secure the basic human rights and sovereignty of Ukrainians. Um, but it's come down to, uh, uh, you know, the very real, real risk of nuclear war, as, as you guys were talking about before, um, which uh, not just puts Ukrainians' lives at risk, but, but everyone's lives at risk. So that's another example where the course of action that we have decided to take in response to, uh, to try and actually secure people's human rights have in many ways um, threatened people's human rights, uh, you know, not just in Ukraine, but, but even, even back here at home. Um, at the risk of going on for too long, I think I'd, I'd leave it there. Great. Well, I, I'd like to, to follow up on that. Um, it, as you were talking about Libya, I was thinking there's, there's no better illustration of the, the subtitle of Hel Helen's book, you know, The Men and Women Who Promised Freedom and Delivered Disaster, than what happened in Libya. I think they went in with very good intentions, but produced an outcome that uh, nobody can look back on and, and feel proud about at this point. But it, it does raise the question, if we take it uh, as a given that the United States does have a moral interest in the well-being of others in, to the degree that we can, helping to promote and safeguard human rights uh, outside our own borders, what then do we do? Um, what, what might work if military intervention uh, has proven so counterproductive? What ought we be doing in this regard? Um, I think number one, um, we have to look at the things that we can control. Um, so of course we have to look at our own actions, uh, you know, the, the actions that are taken by the US government. Um, there's lots of things that the United States does in the world stage that are good. There's lots of things that it does that are bad. And it would be in our interest to, to look at the things that are bad and, and try and change those. I mean, you know, for me, what's happening in Israel is a very good, or, or rather in Gaza, is, is a very good example of that. Um, you know, that's something that the United States has, you know, um, almost direct control over and that it could change just by, by, by shifting its policy. Um, so I think number one there, I think number two, Again, it's, it's thinking harder about our actions to make sure that we don't take actions that end up making things um, much worse. Um, it's, uh, you know, uh, I mentioned Ukraine, but there's so many places where that could uh, apply. I mean, what's happening with Taiwan and China. Um, and I think part of that is also um, not thinking about 
a constantly reactive foreign policy, which I think most of the time is what happens um, in, in Washington. It's events happen and then it's, okay, what do we do? And, and you know, force is often the first resort, not the last one. Um, I think we have to think about things long term. If, if uh, US policy in Eastern Europe and towards Russia had been different, um, you know, over this past decades, uh, we wouldn't get to a point where, uh, in my opinion, if you if you you know really look at the the evidence, I don't think we would have gone to a point where Russia is invading Ukraine. Um, I think similarly, we're at a point where we don't have to uh, necessarily gear ourselves up for a Chinese uh, attack on Taiwan. I think uh, if we just change uh, 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 what we're doing at the moment, we can prevent that from happening. Um, so I think you know thinking about things long term. Um, I think uh, 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 trying to uh, get away from a military first posture, trying to get away from the idea that deterrence is everything and that diplomacy and kind of constructive partnership has no role. I think all of those things are important. And, you know, there's a variety of, of, of soft power tools that, that obviously the United States can draw on before uh, uh, taking the military step. And we've seen that the countries do respond to, to U.S. pressure, uh, you know, with, without a, a, a shot having to be fired. Um, so I think all three of those things, uh, uh, if we if we you know take them seriously, we can prevent the United States from getting uh, uh, you know dragged into more and more disastrous conflicts around the world. All right, we have several questions from the audience. Um, I'm going to start with one. Uh, directly related to something that Senator Vance brought up this morning, and, and that is Saudi Arabia and normalization with uh, Israel. The question is, what do you think about a formal U.S. security guarantee for Saudi Arabia? Both the Trump and Biden administrations have pursued this. They consider this as an important inducement uh, for the Saudis to normalize with Israel for a lot of the reasons that Senator Vance articulated in, in his talk. Is this something that is in the interests of the American people? You know, does this make, would this make Americans more secure, um, better off, more prosperous, the criteria that Jake Sullivan outlined several years ago? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a horrible idea, um, in my opinion. Uh, uh, the idea of the United States or, or, or you know, American uh, uh, citizens being sent to, to fight and kill and die for the Saudi government, one of the most, you know, <laughs> reprehensible human rights abusers uh, on the globe, um, uh, doesn't make any sense to me. It makes even less sense when, I mean, just this week, there was more evidence that, that came out that uh, uh, you know, solidifying the the case for the Saudi government's complicity in September 11. Um, how does it make sense for the United States to hitch itself not just to a, a country with such a heinous human rights record, um, but but also uh, to one that that facilitated or helped facilitate an attack, the worst attack on U.S. soil in history? Um, it, None of that really makes a lot of sense. I think the the uh, focus on the Abraham Accords, I think that's a very popular talking point um, in Washington. Uh, the reality is that that the Abraham Accords are, are a big part of the reason why the Hamas attack happened and why this horrible war is going on right now. Um, and I, you know, unless unless the Biden administration really gets some kind of um, guarantee from Israel as part of this deal that, that there's going to be an actual advancement towards a Palestinian state, um, which it doesn't really seem like it will. Um, I, I don't think, you know, the, the, all this would do is just basically trap the United States into yet another alliance where it would be um, vulnerable to being pulled into a war it doesn't want to go into because of the irresponsibility of, of one of its partners. That's right. Uh, a security guarantee of that kind only makes sense if you, as if America is confident in its ability to exercise leverage over the foreign policy decisions of its client. Um, and uh, for example, you guys may remember the really insane moment in the Bush two years when he wanted to bring Georgia 
into NATO, which was pretty wild. Um, but the the only way that even made any kind of minimal sense is if we could then exercise a little bit of control over Georgia's foreign policy. Uh, and we very quickly learned that we could not, that they would, you know, go around starting conflicts with Russia, as Saakashvili did, uh, and then expect America to back them up. So you only want to bring on a client if you know he's not going to be, uh, you know, a, a yapping yard dog out trying to start fights with bigger dogs and then hoping you're going to back up. And I think the evidence has been that we do not exercise that kind of leverage over Saudi Arabia. So that would be a reckless move. Okay. Um, Another question. The TikTok ban is a wake-up call that U.S.-China policy is dangerously out of control. What can be done to reduce tensions with China and lessen the risks of war? Uh, I think one, obviously, to kind of stop testing the um, line around the red line around Taiwan. Uh, uh, China has been pretty clear on this. Uh, Xi Jinping reportedly told Biden about it directly. He said, "Look, you know, this is this is a huge line for us, and if you cross it, you know, I may not be able to basically not go to war." I mean, it's, it's what's happening there. It, it to me, it's a really surreal slow motion repeat of the exact same thing that we witnessed happening uh in ukraine for years until it finally culminated in in this other terrible war and so it's kind of um you know insane to me that we are basically doing the exact same thing that 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 was done uh, in eastern europe uh and that ended up provoking this war um uh, that, that we're doing the same thing in china which and that war would be you know as, as bad as as the Ukraine war will be, that this war will be, uh, you know, I would say much, much worse. So I think I think that's a that's a good way to go about it. I think um, I don't think a lot of this, um, the the trade war stuff that is going on. I don't think that's a very effective or constructive way to uh, uh, manage competition with China. I don't think that's necessarily going to, um, you know, help rebuild the U.S. industrial base. Uh, I think so far what it just looks like, certainly what, how it's taken in, in, in China is the United States attempt to uh, strangle its own industrial development because it sees it as a, uh, a rival to its own position in the world. Um, so I think, you know, for a start, I think probably those two things, um, if we could slightly just step back a little bit and, and, and you know, uh, move away from that, I think that would be a, a good start. The TikTok ban is interesting. Uh, I agree that we need to minimize needless provocations toward China. On the other hand, there are certain things that any self-respecting country has a right to do. Uh, You don't want a rival nation, a powerful rival nation, controlling critical aspects of your nation's infrastructure. Uh, You know, you you don't want Huawei uh, in charge of critical resources in the United States. Does social media qualify as an industry of that kind that you don't want a rival nation to have control of. I see a strong argument for saying yes. Um, But that being said, uh, I think uh, a relationship of mutual respect is what we should aim for with China. And I think guarding our nations, you know, the the minds of our young people could could very well be part of that. Um, Very interesting comments. And and they... they, uh spark for me some interesting questions. Um, I want to start out by asking about the relationship between uh, the United States involvement in war, in conflict overseas, and the impact of that on civil liberties here at home. Uh, We saw during the global war on terror, which no one has uh, declared over, as far as I know, uh, to this point, that uh, our government believed that it was in the security interests of our nation to intrude on liberties that we've long held as fundamental to the American way of life. And we're hearing today that uh, we have to protect the American people from disinformation and misinformation, and that the government needs to play a more hands-on role in these areas. Why? Because of our rivalry, our competition, the threats posed by foreign states. Um, Is there, in fact, a trade-off 
in this area. And uh, is it in the interests of the American people, if they want to safeguard those liberties, to take the foot off the accelerator pedal a little bit when it comes to getting involved in foreign conflicts? Or are these independent issues? Well, the nice thing about David French is that he doesn't have some of the, the filters that a lot of your liberal pundits do. And so he once really kind of gave an unfiltered comment where he said, you know what we need with all these crazy January 6 types running around? We need a counterinsurgency operation, just like we had you know, in the Middle East, but for Americans. You know, we need to be sponsoring local tribal leaders out in, in the Midwest. It was, it was great. I loved it. It was a really fun riff from him. And, and the real giveaway is that so many of the people currently in the disinformation space um, are, exa are veterans of um, de-radicalization and sort of war on terror, anti-terrorism. Uh, that's, you know, that's what they got their degrees in. And then they figured out that they would get a better job with that degree turning to the domestic audience. It's really a chronic problem uh, that, you know, look at something like the war on Ukraine. You can ask, has it been good for Ukrainian democracy? And that's a valid question. But I always ask, has it been good for American democracy? And the answer is no. Uh, the problem with being a global empire is that then the whole rest of the world starts to take a very great interest in your domestic politics and starts pouring tens of millions of dollars into lobbying your politicians and starts exercising power over your domestic political debate in ways that are often unproductive or illegitimate. And, you know, it's the most undemocratic thing of about the Ukraine war is that the American people you know, it elect, elected Donald Trump because they wanted him to scale back our involvement on the globe. They wanted a more rational foreign policy. And their democratic will is being thwarted by what Donald Trump would call the deep state. Uh, and so the more involved we are in the rest of the world in our foreign policy, it seems the less democratic control American voters are able to exercise over how American power should be used. And that's a decades long ongoing problem, but it just seems to be getting worse and worse. Okay, one final question. I think we're, we're reaching the point where we need to wrap things up, but I, I wanna ask about uh, America's interests in the security, not of American territory per se. I think we all would agree that that's a, a critical interest that uh, all Americans share. But in um, the, the parts of the world that link us together, you know, the United States has long been a trading power. We've been a sea power. We've been an aerospace power. Why? because our connections to the rest of the world are directly related to our own prosperity, our ability to sustain our way of life. So the sea lines of communication that carry goods to and from the United States, um, the uh, orbit of satellites whose functions are absolutely vital to our ability to live day to day, you know, I, I don't know about you, but I couldn't have gotten here this morning without a GPS assist, right? Um, we can't take for granted that, that those areas will simply be secure because other countries won't threaten them. How does the United States, how should we approach safeguarding those links at sea, under the sea, in the air and in space that matter very much to the well-being and security of Americans? Yeah, I mean, I think it comes down to trying to create um, an order that, that is relatively stable, you know, not just, not just peaceful, but actually stable and where every state, certainly every, every you know, immensely powerful state feels like it has an actual uh, buy-in to the, uh, the functioning of the system. You know, I mean, I think it's not a uh, coincidence that the uh, Nord Stream pipeline, which had been contentious for many, many years, was finally actually destroyed and blown up um, 
because of this uh, war in Ukraine. So I think um, you know the the most likely way to actually prevent all these all this this vital infrastructure from being uh, destroyed um, is is um, to to foster you know uh, stable stable relations between countries so that there is no real incentive um, to to uh, uh, you know attack it and try and undermine each other um, and and part of that is you know I think that with the China question I think it's possible to for the United States to compete with China. I think it's possible for the United States to invest more money into itself, into its own uh, domestic economy and stop sending it into, into wars overseas um, without necessarily severing uh, the links that the United States has to China, without tarnishing that relationship completely to the point that um, one or both parties think, you know what, um, I'm at a point where um, I know this might be might cost me, but maybe I will, you know, attack a satellite or maybe i will destroy a pipeline or maybe i will uh cause chaos by destroying one of these undersea cables um i think that that is entirely possible um and i think it's something that that you know the united states should should pursue yeah i think the key in this as in many aspects of american foreign policy is to be minimalist in our objectives, to be clear and moderate um, in the things that we're trying to achieve. Do we have an interest in protecting sea lanes? Yes. However, being able to do that depends on not then exceeding that mandate and saying, well, your country is adjacent to a sea lane, therefore we're going to meddle in your domestic politics. Um, I think you need to have limited objectives and then try to achieve them uh, in the same way that uh, you mentioned human rights earlier. I think guarding human rights is important, but the problem is that the human rights mandate that the State Department understands has multiplied beyond, you know, keeping people alive and averting genocide and is now involved in, you know, human rights means making sure your domestic policy is sufficiently feminist. Um, you know, don't don't add on things to the Christmas tree. Just focus on the basics. Keep to the basics. That's what we need to do. Okay. One final related question. Um, much of our economy and by extension, the the day-to-day -day lives of Americans depends increasingly on things like rare earth minerals, without which none of this gee whiz technology is going to work particularly effectively. And much of that mineral wealth does not lie within the, the borders of the United States. Much of it is, over, is overseas. Um, to what degree should the United States be competing with uh, other powers, China, for example, for influence um, in places like Africa, which has an abundance of, of these minerals? Um, do we have a stake in what could be a new competition in this part of the world? And how should we approach that? We do have an interest in competing, but our foreign policy keeps getting in the way. Um, if you go anywhere in Africa and ask them to describe the competition between the United States and China for things like resources in their nation, they'll say, well, the reason why we are disinclined to go with the US is because if we sign on with you guys, we get a whole laundry list of complaints about human rights and this and that and our domestic policies. And there's a, it, it's a whole web of demands um, whereas the Chinese are more willing to have it be simply a business relationship. Um, I, I think that that's, that's a fair criticism. And if that's what we're hearing in Africa, I think it makes a lot of sense to change our posture towards those countries in response to that. We got to listen to what people are saying. Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, unfortunately the United States has a long history of, of interfering in the domestic politics of other countries. It has a long history of, carrying out regime change, not just through war, but through, you know, more covert means. Um, and I think all of that, that, that long history has piled up um, in conjunction with, as you say, all these complaints that, that, that these governments have about being lectured and about being told how to, uh, how to govern, how to live their lives, um, to, to make countries, you know, more favorable towards China, who they don't see as a lecturing power, who they don't, view as a potential threat if they if they allow them into the country that that will be used as a kind of trojan horse to eventually change the government or or influence its policies um i don't think that's insurmountable 
Um, I think the problem is that that um, that kind of uh, uh, policy by the United States has kind of remained. You know, I think when you look at things like the the Maidan revolution in in Ukraine and the the, the U.S. government involvement in that, um, or you know, more recently some of the foreign uh, involvement in the the protests in Georgia, I think all of that helps to kind of um, uh, uh, back up this idea that that governments in in africa and other parts of the world have that that oh okay uh the united states and the west are basically still up to their old tricks they have not uh changed they still want to come in and basically order us uh, around so i think taking steps to to no longer do that to no longer kind of be perceived as meddling in in, in other countries affairs i think will will help a great deal in terms of confidence building for these countries to say yeah come on in you know american businesses is, is welcome in Great. Thank you both very much. I think it's been a fascinating discussion. Um, we have uh, lunch coming up. We have a few minutes where you all can uh, take a rest break. Um, but then after that, come get your lunches. Uh, the boxes are over uh, on the, uh, the tables uh, at the, uh, the entrance to the, to the room. Then Rand Paul will be joining us, Senator Rand Paul, for some lunch remarks. And he will be, as I understand it, taking questions from the audience. So thank you very much. <laughs>